a long complicated drum part or for us two over two hours of a live show there isn't so it's a subverbal language you just learn like another language you know and it comes together over time so it's not a mental it's, a it's absolutely mental but all mental thinking i think is dimensional you know it, and uh, i was reading something carl jung or somebody recently about three-dimensional thoughts how you picture things in in three dimensions and be, that's why your brain can hold so much because it's not two-dimensional it's three-dimensional so when the symbolic language and hieroglyphics that that bring a drum pattern together or, or help you memorize a poem or uh, you know for a reporter to remember the facts at the scene of the crime or whatever there's a dimensional hierarchy of things that trigger each other uh, a friend of mine has a theory that they can only have six things in your brain at a time and i happen to think that's true in the forefront of your brain there can only be a handful of things, but each of them can trigger back like, like a computer does. You know, you can go back in hypercard, one thing triggers another bank of knowledge, triggers another one, so you can go, um, you know, deeper into the dimensional memory. Is that, that a way. conscious, subconscious difference? Or? Um, for anyone who's read Carl Jung, yeah, I would put it in, in the unconscious realm that's readily available to the conscious mind. <laughs> Get out of here. Yeah. Well, I think beyond a certain level, I mean, for me, 25 years down the line, uh, playing is the best practice. And I play, you know, over two hours in the show, plus sound check, so nearly three hours a day. I have a little practice kit in the dressing room that I've been using lately uh, just to play around with new ideas and that stuff. So, uh, to the contrary, I think I play to, in front of an audience, you're going to play at an extreme level that you would never do in a practice room because it hurts. or practicing I'll go till it hurts and then I'll stop but in front of an audience you can you know if it starts to hurt or if you get a cramp or if you cut your finger or any of those things you have your you know willpower has to take you beyond those things and discipline demands it so I play at a much greater level live and in fact that's why I rehearse when I'm rehearsing for a tour I play to the records because that's me at a superhuman level that's better than I can really play so if I work if I try to rehearse to that level it drives me to the level that I'll need for a, a live performance but if you, you feel the the expectation from an audience that even if you don't feel well, even if something hurts, even if you're not having a great night, you know, you have to, you have to push it out. It's just like a, a responsibility, I think, that you just feel night after night. I you remember how to do everything. Uh, you said in your last Modern Drummer article that you were finally confident in your playing. I'm sorry? You said in your, in your last Modern Drummer article that you were finally confident in your right. playing. Uh, my question is, when you play, are you, when you're using you know, rhythms or paradiddles, whatever, are you still thinking paradiddle, paradiddle? Or no, it gets into that language thing I was talking about before, that I just know what, what button to push that'll take me to the thing I need to get to. And uh, same with counting. I almost never need to count anymore because it becomes a cycle. And as we discussed, one thing sets up the next thing. So I'm constantly aware of where I am within the arrangement of the song um, and what's coming. I've, I've talked again with other drummers about this, and you can't be thinking about what you're playing right now. I think anyone would agree with that. It's a fundamental thing that if you're thinking about what you're playing right now, then you're going to fall apart in the next phrase, you know? So for me, I'm playing where I am, and, and I'm at least um, probably four bars ahead in my brain, setting myself up physically. Again, with a wide kit where your, your fulcrum and, and your point of balance is changing, it's most important to be rooted. And if I change from being in the hi-hat to the ride cymbal, I have to set up my shift of balance. If I come over to these pads or over to the marimba, I'm way out of balance. So I have to set myself up a long time in advance to get to those things. So there's a train of thought, I would say, that's, that's probably about 20 to 30 seconds ahead of where I am. So you have to have the confidence of, of what you're doing right now. You thought about that 30 seconds ago, so it's going to be okay and be thinking ahead to the next transition to the next change especially when you get down to small points of tempo when you want smoothness in and out of a fill and when you're dealing with sequencers or playing to a click or something um, not only is it desirable it's absolutely necessary that you have that that smoothness and so therefore it's necessary to set yourself up so far in advance I just sorry I just want to check out what we were talking about Uh, a lot actually and uh, the second one I did today bravado was an example of that where 
Um, I, I seem to have found a pattern for myself anyways that it takes three days of solid work to develop a set of lyrics, to develop a, a drum pattern, because you have to re-examine what you've done all the time, and it's necessary to get away from it and come back. And when I was rehearsing for the album this time, uh, I had a, a couple of weeks just for myself, so I had a work tape, and I'd spend a couple of hours on each song, and then I'd know I'd done as much as I could, and I'd go on to another song. The next day, go through the cycle again, and every time I'd find a new detail or um, a new bit of, or if I could punch up the rhythm of the vocals or, or little things like that that make it so satisfying, or a new rhythmic approach to something. But some of them are really hard. If you're trying to stay out of a cliche, um, some songs just drive me crazy. And, and day after day, I'll think I'm getting nowhere with this. It doesn't feel good. I, I don't like playing it. There's something wrong with the song. You know, but by the third day, um, something comes together. And I find the same with lyrics. I'll sit there for two days in front of lyrics going, this is awful, I hate it, why don't I just burn it and go home? But by the third day, all of that starts to come together. And I go, oh yeah. And same with a drum part too. I'll sit there and slave over it and slave over it, thinking so depressed and so down on myself. And then finally the key, or finally just the confidence comes. And I play it all together and go, yeah. So uh, in answer to that, it, it bit by bit it comes together. I start out with possibilities. Pardon? I'll play to a demo tape of it, and I usually like to work without the other guys because, again, I mentioned before, I don't like being the drum machine for them, and I don't like the feeling that they're slaving for me. So I get them to make me a work tape of the song just to a drum machine or something, and then as I play along with it, I try all the possibilities. Because, again, I think I've written about this before, two ways to approach learning a song. Start from the minimalist point of view of the very smallest possible thing you can do, or the maximalist. Play, I'll, the first time through, I'll play everything that can possibly fit in that rhythm. I'll try everything, and it'll sound chaotic, um, but I'll gradually eliminate, okay, this works, but it doesn't really do anything, so I'll throw that out. This works, and it can take me somewhere, and I can multiply it or subtract from it and all this. For me, I start with everything and then subtract. Some drummers would start with, the, with one beat and then add to it slowly. Whatever works for you, I would say. I always judge by most recent work, for it, so to me, the whole Roll the Bones album represents me today and what I think, you know, so I don't know about that. They're doing it on purpose. Good point, good point. And one thing that I really was careful of with this album that I wanted to be very precisely arranged in all the drum parts and work them out, but spontaneity is important too. And I learned to trick myself into being spontaneous in that a song uh, like Bravado or Roll the Bones, I worked out pretty well the whole song. And I would always leave a part that I wouldn't let myself work out. And every time I came to it, I would make my mind go blank, and whatever happened, happened. Because there is a special edge to something that's never been played before, that way or whatever. So when I came into the studio, studio knowing the song really well so I'd be able to get a good performance of it rapidly but at the same time I was at such a pitch of concentration and excitement that when I came to the improvised parts the spontaneous parts that had never been done that way they would come out accurate but there would be an ex extra edge to them just something just 
uh, you would never get, no, no other listener would ever pick it up but me, but I think there's an intangible excitement that it adds to it. It's, it can never be over-rehearsed that way. It can never be too pat and, you know, too precise because this thing, this part of the song, this transition, this drum fill never happened that way before. So I think you can have both. I think you can work it out so that you know that drum part so well that you can record it in a snap really well and at the same time go for something extra special that's never happened before. So I think I better take two more questions. There's a bunch of guys have work to do up here, so I'll take two more, yeah. I was wondering, um, you did a collaboration with a band called Max Webster. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering if you were, uh, if you'd done anything else besides, I think this tune is called Battle Scars. Right, yeah. A lot of little things along the way, mostly on a friendly basis, though. We are so satisfied by what we get to do. Every style of drumming I like to play, I get to play. Um, I did a thing a month ago just doing hand drums with a, a, a band that I'm friends with in Toronto and just came in and did some bongos and did some cowbells and tambourine and that kind of stuff. But it's basically just to work with friends rather than a musical compulsion. None of us needs a solo album because every record is each of our solo albums really so uh, in, and each of us have done those kind of things with helping out a band or working with friends or something like that but very informally and, and on a very small scale mostly. don't have much time either yeah exactly so yeah we've been on tour for eight months now and we're in the studio for six months before that so we're, we're pretty busy just on this thing okay one last one where haven't i been yet uh yeah down here what sort of education have you had as far as drums everything lyrical um Drumming, I had an excellent teacher that started me off, and I think that's the irreplaceable magic touch. I went in, I, he only, he quit teaching after about 18 months, but in that 18 months he gave me the best grounding of the directions that I needed to go. He gave me a great set of values of what a good drummer should be able to do and how high you should aim in terms of perfection and technique. I think in my first drum lesson he played me uh, the drum battle of the famous Buddy Rich Dean Krupa one. He said, right, here's where we're going. And then he picked up the sticks and showed me how to hold them and says, here's how we're going to get there. Uh, but most importantly, after about six or eight months, he, had the, he gave me the piece of encouragement that I needed. You know, I've been working on all this stuff and learning how to read, learning my rudiments and all the stuff that you need to start with. But at about the six month point, he told me that if I worked at it, I would be a drummer. And it was like, that's all I needed to hear. You know, I'd never found anything up to that time. I'd never been good in sports or anything else particularly. So that was like the spark. And then from when he quit teaching, I tried a few other teachers and the magic wasn't there. So I went to the radio and I went to other drummers on record and just started learning that way or going to see people and self-taught in a sense, but there's a beautiful quote that the man who says he's self-taught has been taught by a fool because you don't learn from yourself. You learn from other drummers, you know, and you learn from music. And I, I happened to think at the time the best way to learn was playing along with the radio because I had no choice. It wasn't like a lot of people put on their favorite record and drum along with it. I think that's kind of limiting. I would put on Top 40 radio and I would have to play to every song that came on, however stupid it was, however much I hated it, however lame the drum part was. But I learned a flexibility and a tolerance for different styles and I think an adaptability too, just from a little plastic AM radio. So those are kind of things that are special. Uh, in formal education, the same sort of thing happened. As soon as I found these things, nothing else existed. So I got out of school, but then went on to become self-taught through you know, doing a lot of reading and, and making friends who were uh, educated in different areas and learning from them and so on so uh, yeah no, that, that's purely a joke came open eyes and open ears I think is the the best school room uh, I'm gonna have to let these guys get, guys get to work thanks a lot for coming out I hope you got something out of it.
All right, so go ahead, and you're talking to him. And let's see, and I'm talking to, you're talking to him also. Okay. Okay, we're ready and rolling. So what did you think of the uh, Neil Pert Clinic at the Irvine Meadows? Oh man, it was great, you know. I mean, for me it's like kind of historic day because he was kind of my idol and I come from so far away, Argentina, you know, and I never guess, you know, it's kind of opportunity. So him, you know, a couple, I don't know, inches, <laughs> you know, playing, you know, he's like a genius. He's in, I don't know, other kind of level, you know, his personality, he's perfect, you know. So it was, it's kind, it was great to be here, you know. It's, I don't know, I don't know how to say. <laughs> <laughs> Speech Come switch sides with me and do one more question. Anything you would, anything you think anybody would want to know, just stand right. Uh, what do you think of his drum kit? So drum kit, you know, looks, I mean, original, you know, but I suppose he plays with a bigger drums and bigger toms, but it's, I don't know, very strange, you know. It's kind of electronic scenes, very particular. I mean, I think he. He shows his personality, you know, over the drum set, and it's great, you know. Great. Awesome. Okay. If you get interviewed, stand right over here behind Johnny. We'll get